Well, Jeff, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing? Um, we're doing well, Dan. How are you doing? Well, it's been some time. Uh, it's been a few moons, it's been a while. Uh, but uh, but I'm glad to be back. Yeah, it feels good to be back in the podcast seat. So today we want to deal with the psychology of apologies. And I think this topic is re very relevant to most of us because at one time or another, we might have been a transgressor offending someone else. And at other times, we might have been the victim mm -hmm. uh, of a transgression and experiencing how that felt. And I think, uh, Jeff, in keeping with the early themes of our podcast, we can consider a more concrete situation involving COVID, this COVID event, since that's been unfolding over the last two or three years. Some people maybe still believe it's still going on. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe it's still a, a topic that we ought to discuss. And yeah. uh, maybe we can start this way, we can set up this scenario. Imagine that, that during COVID, you were someone who treated other people, particularly, let's say, the unvaccinated people, because they were just allowed to be vilified by everyone, that you treated those people poorly. Perhaps you advocated for them to be fired or you maybe prevented them from traveling. And uh, you probably did this because you were told by the health authorities and by media and by people in, in, in power that COVID was going to kill a lot of people, that these vaccines that were rolling out and all the interventions, they were going to stop infection, they were going to stop the spread, and that the vaccine would be, would be safe, they were going to be effective and perfectly safe. And so maybe you engaged in some behavior that uh, was not very nice to other people. So now, though, maybe things have changed a little bit because what we're seeing, the big elephant in the room, I think, is, and it's like this monster that's getting bigger and bigger, is that the things that we were told as being clearly true based on the settled science have maybe turned out not to be so true, mm. you know? And you could, you could put in your example here uh, if you want, but, you know, we know that the virus wasn't actually as deadly as initially thought. The vaccines didn't stop infection and spread of the virus. You know, people maligned naturally acquired immunity. They said it wasn't as good as a vaccine-induced uh, immunity, but in fact, now we know that natural immunity is just as good, if not better, than vaccine-induced immunity. I think we always knew that um, in, the, in the scientific literature. Um, yeah, we were told maybe that, uh, you know, some of, you, some of the details, like that the mRNA from the vaccine was going to stay in your deltoid, right? You were going to get the injection in your deltoid. It was going to stay there, create an immune response. Mm -hmm. But but now, I don't know if you've been following the most recent literature, but there's a, a new paper that's come out that's even showed that in women, the mRNA from the vaccine can enter mm -hmm. the breast milk. Um, mm -hmm. And that's published in a top journal. You know, so we found out all these things. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, based on the initial information, you maybe acted terribly to some people. What do you do now? What do you do? I'll say I'll add to that your list. There that was an awesome list. I'll add some of the non-pharmaceutical interventions oh, that yeah, go ahead are starting to become a little bit more uh, recognized as being maybe no evidence for efficacy would be one way yeah. to put it. Yeah, but yeah, that's a great question. So what do you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can just pretend like nothing ever happened. Yeah. Just you just go on, on, right? Just go on, yeah. which seems to be the popular the popular choice, I think, these days. Yeah, in, you just go on. It's circles. like, what pandemic? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was there was a pandemic and things yeah. happened, but... Yeah, and we did it. How are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's an option. Yeah. Another option, a bold option, that's kind of the main topic of our of our podcast today is well you could apologize i think some people are maybe waiting for might be waiting for apologies from certain people and they're saying well where you know where where is it i'm still you know i'm due for i'm due for one here maybe several depending on your situation depending on what happened to you uh and maybe they it hasn't happened or if it has happened you know maybe it wasn't a good quality apology because maybe it's not just a matter of whether or not apology happens but there's degrees and and um, types of apologies with respect to how good or bad they are yeah and there's a whole literature in in psychology about apologies specifically quality of apologies and the efficacy of apologies and what happens when when people apologize or don't apologize 
Yeah. So let's launch right into that. Maybe before we do that, just one other potential response that I think people engage in, which is just to deny, minimize, and justify yep. Uh, yep. the situation, right? <laughs> so we can talk about that a little bit later. Because yeah. we see some of our politicians now basically saying, what mandates? We never gave it. We never made any mandates. We never forced anybody. <laughs> but we can get to that. Yeah. But yeah, apology apology is certainly an option. And there's all this interesting literature on apologies, as you say. And uh, I, I have here a paper by Karina Schumann, published in, the, in uh, Current Directions in Psychological Science. So a top journal in the field titled, The Psychology of Offering an Apology understanding the barriers to apologizing and how to overcome them. And she articulates the benefits of apologies. And here's what she says, quote, a victim can forgive the transgressor and this forgiveness can restore the victim's feelings of closeness with the transgressor, increase his or her willingness to cooperate with the transgressor and improve his or her personal well-being. And uh, she goes on to say, research on conflict management suggests that an apology is one of the most powerful tools that transgressors can use to resolve an offense, both mm -hmm. in their own eyes and in the eyes of the victim. Yeah, there's even there's a, a meta-analysis that was done, and one of the, the strongest predictors of forgiveness in the positive direction is apology. So receiving an apology is one of the strongest effect sizes. Point around yeah. point four. So there's you know, a, lot you, of data, a lot of data on that too. Yeah, and you bring up the the concept of forgiveness, which is, you know, for the way I'm thinking about it is for our society to be able to effectively move forward beyond all the things that happened during COVID, mm -hmm. there has to be this this collective apologizing and forgiving, mm -hmm. because I think that frees people up to now actually enter into positive relationships with each other and move forward in a positive way. So this mm -hmm. is, I would say, in fact, for our society is fundamental, foundational. Yeah. Yeah. There's almost, it's almost as if there's still this separation of worlds where there's been like an offending side and a victim side, and they're still, they're still living in these, in these separate realities because there hasn't been any reconciliation of any, of any kind. Yeah, that's right. And that, that probably happens in the microcosm of couples, um, yep. families, workplaces, countries, <laughs> right? <laughs> World events. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's all going on. Uh, Schumann also has this really interesting paper, Jeff, in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. And there's a very useful table uh, that I'm looking at here on my screen where she talks about the elements of effective apologies mm. and then gives some examples. Do you mind if I just go through those real quick? Yeah, great idea. Okay. So the first one is, in a good apology, the person apologizing expresses remorse. The example she gives is, quote, I feel terrible, I regret it, and, you know, just saying, I apologize, I'm sorry. So that's, that's number mm -hmm. one, expressing remorse. Number two, acceptance of responsibility. You would say something like, I'm truly sorry for breaking my promise. Third one is repair. You offer some way to fix or compensate for the offense. Mm -hmm. So we can think about, you can apply these in our minds, we don't have to, but in the context of COVID, right? So obviously, if you know you had fired somebody during COVID because of their you know lack of vaccination or whatever, one way to repair things is to hire them back. And in fact, yes. I know that in some cases that's going on. Mm -hmm. Number four, explanation you try to give an explanation or reason for why you acted the way you did forbearance you promise to behave better in the future that's what she has here and the example is i'm taking steps to make sure it never happens again mm -hmm. yeah so in the context of covid it might be something like an institution saying you know what we're never going to do this kind of thing again where we make a mandate and not give people exemptions and uh, people end up being fired. That's just never yeah. going to happen, and we're just going to call it right now. There's two more. Acknowledgement of harm, and the last one is admission. Oh, there's another one after that. Admission of wrongdoing, and then a request for forgiveness. Please forgive me. It's as simple as that. Very, very powerful statement. 
Yeah, so you could see from that list, it's quite an extensive list. And you could see as the list sort of rattles on, like the how the apology would really fill out and really have an impact. And you could almost break it down into in terms of like two categories, where there's sort of like an empathy side, and then there's like a compensation side. It's like you got to express the empathy, and then you got to you got to do something to try and restore, restore the harm or restore the balance in some way. It makes me, it makes me think of this. Uh, it was a tweet by um, Doctor. I can I don't know how to say his name right. Carriart Carriardi. Um, it was uh, it was back in June. Uh, sort of on this topic, you said the only six words from doctors and the medical establishment. So he was a, he was an ethicist, I believe, at a medical school who got fired for refusing or not complying with the mandates, the vaccine mandates, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Or is that, yep. is that yep. yours? Okay. That, that's um, my recollection. So it's, it's always a bad sign when the ethicists are getting fired. <laughs> right. <laughs> when the medical ethicists for, are getting, yeah, <laughs> for, to get, getting, to getting fired. fired for medical for, issues. From universities. And, from yeah. universities. <laughs> Is that the canary in the in the coal mine there? Um, he says the uh, the only six words from doctors in the medical establishment capable of restoring public trust right now, and he says, "quote I was wrong." Period. I am sorry. He says many are still waiting to hear those words from their physician, with few notable exceptions. Most have not said them. So he's not necessarily wrong, but he's also not necessarily right. And when we when we break down the psychology of apology in terms of quality of apology it wouldn't necessarily be sufficient or enough for a physician just to say they were wrong in their story that would be two parts but there would be many so if we're going to critique that you know if we're going to critique that tweet we'd say okay but you also want to add in expressing remorse showing forbearance attempting reparations in some way etc cetera, etc cetera, right if we really if we really want to be um specific about quality apologies yeah. And, and we see that we see these elements actually come into play with the professional ap professional apology writers when when governments, uh, you know, yeah. acknowledge transgressions of the past. They never actually acknowledge their own transgressions <laughs> for reasons that we might discuss. Um, but mm -hmm. but they will say, you know, many moons ago uh, in yeah, history, somebody else, some other leader in our country did something bad to some people. And now we're going to apologize for that. And then they have all these things. Right. And then yeah. they have some like reparations in there, too. Right. Which was be like the idea of of taking responsibility and actually mm -hmm. trying to do something about it. Um, yeah, that that actually makes me think of the I think the best off the top of my head, I think one of the best apologies that I've seen actually came from um, the premier of Alberta. Ah, uh, this is Danielle Smith. And not coincidentally enough, she came into office well after things, the dust had sort of settled. So she didn't have anything to do with any of the policies, but I think she issued one of the better, one of the, one of the better apologies in terms of uh, hitting some of the, hitting some of the important notes. So I have here from a, a, a clip actually that came to me from the Jimmy Dior show. And it, it's it's hard to hear exactly what's going on there, but I'll play the clip. How's that? That's a good idea. During your campaign, you said that not only would you issue an apology to those prosecuted during COVID restrictions, but you would also grant them amnesty. When can you expect those apologies? So the reporter asked, you promised that you would uh, you would not... Well, here, let me start it again. I miss my city dollars with Rebel News. During your campaign, you said that not only would you issue an apology to those prosecuted during COVID. Would you not only issue an apology to those prosecuted during COVID, but you would also... Restrictions. But you would also grant them amnesty. But also grant them amnesty. Okay, so here's what she says. When can we expect those apologies? Uh, I can apologize right now. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply sorry for anyone who was inappropriately subjected to uh, discrimination as a result of their vaccine status. I'm deeply sorry for any government employee that was fired from their job because of their vaccine status. And I welcome them back if they want to come back. As for the amnesty, I have to get some legal advice on that. Um, and so I've already asked my staff to, um, to, to request that advice so I can see how we would be able to proceed on that. My view has been that these were um, political decisions that were made, and so I think that they could be political decisions to offer a reversal. But I, I do want to get some, some legal advice on that first. 
Would that also have to do with the timeline for the proposed analysis? Um, I, I, I would have to see, you know, if I can, if I can do it, I, mean, I will do it at the earliest opportunity. So I'm, I'm hoping within the next, within the next week, I'll get that legal advice. Thank you. Thank you. So isn't that nice? There's someone in power actually apologizing for what they did to the unvaccinated and offering them their jobs back. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Dior there narrating there at the end. <laughs> So yeah, I think that I think that apology was was really interesting to see how easy it kind of came to her. There wasn't any consternation. She's like, "Can you is it, you said you're gonna apologize? She said, oh, you want apologize? I'll apologize right now. No problem. No sweat. Here, here, here it is. I'm deeply, I'm deeply sorry. It's really easy. Yeah, and, 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 and also and... it has the uh, the compensation or the restoration attempt as well in terms of getting the jobs back, rehiring, and then maybe looking into this amnesty idea of any kind of legal issues having them go away so it's got it's got a two it's got many it's got a couple characteristics i think are very uh very useful for quality of uh, apologies there yeah and notice that she has to ask her lawyers about the legal issues right (laughs) yeah so so that 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 brings up um barriers to apologizing effectively right because Mm -hmm. in some cases it's very costly to apologize and then so people might be like well i can't apologize because it, it does a lot of different things, right? So we, 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 we can talk about that in a minute as well. Um, I also have this clip from a town councillor. Do, do you want me to play that clip? Yeah, that's a good one. This is a good one, I think, that shows um, it hits certain elements. This was one that actually fooled me. I thought at first this was a really good apology. And then playing it back and thinking about more, it misses misses some pieces. Yeah. It hits one note particularly strong, but I think it's lacking in other ways, but we can we can hear. Yeah, so uh, she's reading, obviously, this is a counselor, and she's kind of stumbling through it, but uh, bear with us here. This is from uh, a, a municipality, I think, in Ontario somewhere. Yeah, it's, it right? says here at the bottom of the screen here, West Nipissing Council Chambers. Okay. Whereas at the meeting held on December 20th, 2022, council agreed with staff's recommendation to rescind the municipal vaccination policy, number 2022-18, be it therefore resolved that the vaccination policy number 2022-18 is hereby rescinded effective immediately. Questions or comments? Mm-hmm. Councillor Tessier? I would like to just make a comment if I could uh, okay. read. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge that this policy caused a lot of unnecessary harm and animosity within our workforce and community. I believe that this possible policy was mistakenly adopted 12 months ago. The general population knows that today th- that today that the COVID vaccine doesn't stop the spread of the virus. 12 months ago, the Municipal Council was well aware that the spread did not co- co- correlate with vaccination status prior to this policy being adopted. Uh, a constituent had presented to Council the public health on- Ontario data showing that the, that by January 2022, there were equally equally or more cases report, reported per capita in vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people. Unfortunately, the outcome of the vote from the Municipal Council resulted in the implementation of this punitive policy. With all my heart, I extend my apologies to those who were affected ne- negatively by this policy, and I hope that as a municipality and a community, we can m- move forward. Thank you. Okay, what you thoughts? About, what do you think about it? I think, I think it's great in terms of expressions of empathy, acknowledging harm, but there's no attempt at any sort of um, compensation or restoration. Um, there's no seeking of forgiveness. It's kind of like if we can just all move on. Uh, and it was interesting, you know, I don't know what the story is there, but there wasn't, it was almost like a, uh, not it, not accepting responsibility in a way that like other people had decided to do this, which may be fair. Um, but there was a bit of a distancing and, um, rash, uh, justifying, uh, as well, I think in, in that, but I think the big ones would be like not having any kind of compensation attempt, seeking forgiveness or any really re- any explicit acceptance of responsibility. But there was an explanation as to like why things happened, but it was a bit of a justification and maybe 
maybe not ideal in those ways. What, what's your, what's your take on that one? Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, it's probably a little bit different. Um, if a person apologizes versus like a counselor mm. apologizing for a group, because yeah. I think some of the distancing that you might might have heard there might have been could be attributed to the fact that she's she's really apologizing for a wider group and not her own personal behavior. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I, I suspect that some of these people were kind of they were hesitant, right? Like they didn't want to do this, but they kind of at the time felt that it was a necessary thing to do, and or that they were, had to do it anyways, even though they didn't want to. So, you know, so then they are distancing a little bit because they felt like they you know didn't transgress as much, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, it certainly isn't like it's not. There. There are ways to improve that apology based on the yeah. criteria that's uh, offered in the Schumann paper. But it is. It is good. That's you know. That's pretty shocking to see. And I think it's not a coincidence that 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 would be the case. That the people, the two examples we have so far of apologies from politicians are ones who probably didn't themselves agree with the uh, policies in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes it much easier. Do you have any other examples of, of apologies that you want to deconstruct? Do we want to talk about maybe we can kind of get into some non-apologies? Well, I have Justin Trudeau. <laughs> Do you want to start with our, yeah, our, our, our dear leader? Okay, let's see what I got here. Just okay, so second. before we get into that, before we get into that, maybe I'll just do a quick rundown on. So in addition to apologies, there's a, there's sort of a non-apology framework. Um, and some of the non-apology behaviors consist of justifying blaming the victim diminishing responsibility denial lashing out and coming up with excuses yeah. so that list you can find that list or that list generally comes from a non-apology scale there's actually a scale that measures non-apology so after some kind of you know infraction those are known and categorizable res responses that would constitute a non-apology yeah, um, the Schumann paper has this category uh, referred to as defensive strategies, which I think would fall into this, which are very similar. And some of those overlap with what you've just said. Mm. Uh, justification, victim blaming. <laughs> yeah, check, um, check. Yeah, try to put the responsibility on on, on the victim. Um, excuse, excuse making, yeah. and minimization. Da okay. Downplaying yeah. the consequences of one's actions. Yeah. Um, so those would be also like all of these kind of non-apology, maybe defensive strategies that people yeah. implement and so on. Okay, but here, here's Trudeau um, talking at uh, some sort of a public event and he starts to get into COVID. And you can hear him sort of trying to justify and, and maybe slightly change uh, his story about what happened in the past. We'll play the whole thing. And then there's a, there's a, a, a clip from from Sky News, where they actually put what he said in that apology side by side to what he said back during COVID, oh, nice. just to contrast yeah. them, and then so we can look at that. But here's the, here's the full segment of him at this public event. And the challenge that we have now is that increasingly, misinformation and disinformation is carrying people to believe things that are untrue. And vaccinations is a perfect example of it. Like any modern bit of medical advancements, there are potential side effects in vaccinations. And there you know, are people who've probably gotten very sick from vaccinations on the billions of people who've been vaccinated against COVID over the past few years. But there are far more people who obviously have died due to COVID, died from not getting vaccinated. And the idea that people can fly in the face of science, well, individuals are allowed to make their own choices. There may be all sorts of different reasons why someone is hesitant to get vaccinated. But I make a distinction, and I have always have, between someone choosing for personal reasons to choose not to get vaccinated and someone deliberately using misinformation to mislead and scare other people with so-called facts that aren't facts at all that lead them to make a choice that endangers their lives and the lives of other citizens so as prime minister 
through the greatest public health crisis that we've faced in a hundred years in this country, since the Spanish flu, my responsibility was to keep as many Canadians alive as possible. And all of the scientists and the medical experts and the researchers, not just in Canada, but around the world, understood that vaccination was going to be the way through this. And therefore, while not forcing anyone to get vaccinated, I chose to make sure that all the incentives and all the protections were there to encourage Canadians to get vaccinated. And that's exactly what they did. We got vaccinated to a higher level than just about any other of our peer countries. And that's why we had a less deadly pandemic than most other countries. Foam finger number one. Yeah. <laughs> We're the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's a well, okay whining, so that's a whining i think i got a non-apology bingo on that one okay i think i did too so what, what what did you capture there oh my goodness okay so the the acknowledgement of the side effects is is shocking right off the top there yeah that's so that's there's an admission the, there's an admission yeah there's a there's a recognition there's an acknowledgement of of harm which is yeah but, out of left field but in yes right away like minimized. right away it's minimized minimized that's right yeah. so that's one of our defensive for... strategies here according to uh schumann um mm -hmm. is minimization so right away yeah. it's like yeah some people got injured but yeah. very few uh, compared to the would... billions that we yeah. saved yeah it's really yeah. it's really obvious that it's for it's for the best yeah 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 and then you get you get yeah so then you get some like pretty some justification going on there explanation as to why um i thought there was get... there was maybe even a bit i thought there was maybe even a bit of victim blaming in the sense that it's like the... you chose to do this i i mm -hmm. you know i didn't force anybody yeah well there's the there's the separation the distinction between oh you if you do it for personal reasons I've never had a problem with you it's when you do it for the misinformation reasons that's where there's a problem so those mm -hmm. are the ones the, it's it's th th those are the uh the appropriate victims of of any kind of like bullying policy or over overreach policy those are you know those are the ones that deserve it those, those uh, any any time i've talked about any of this those that's who i've been talking about i've been talking about the the good ones over here who have their, their mm -hmm. personal reasons which then kind of maybe fits into some of the lashing out of like okay well we're not i'm not gonna not only am i not going to apologize but i'm going to sort of continue instituting policies or continue public statements that vilify and demonize i'm just going to keep going keep going with that which we can which would be consistent with the lashing out strategy he doesn't demonstrate that in yep. this clip per se, but it's maybe it's in the historical record. There's a big, uh, there's a big, big fat denial in there too. Did you catch that? The uh, I never forced, I never forced anybody. Right. <laughs> that might be in That's the. Right. Uh, I'm sure there's 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 lots of clips of him being out there saying how he's going to force people to. Oh, we I got that was in a sec. I got something <laughs> in a second to show you. <laughs> Misinformation and disinformation is carrying people to believe things that are untrue. And vaccinations is a perfect example of it. Any vaccine we distribute to Canadians will be safe for Canadians. You know, our people who've probably gotten very sick from vaccinations. To every vaccine that is improved uh, is safe for Canadians, is uncompromising. Well, individuals are allowed to make their own choices. There may be all sorts of different reasons why someone is hesitant to get vaccinated. There's no more excuses to not get your shot. And therefore, while not forcing anyone to get vaccinated, enforcement measures in place will make sure that everyone is vaccinated. I chose to make sure that all the incentives, travelers across the country need to be fully vaccinated. People coming into the country need to be fully vaccinated. We're there. Don't get to work in the public service. Don't get to go to movie theaters or gyms or restaurants. So that's the, yeah, it is. That's, that, that, that's the compilation. 
Yeah. I love the use of enforcement there. I did not force there will be enforcement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's nice to see people actually putting these compilations side by side and showing that they're actually saying the exact opposite, which I think is the definition of gaslighting. So, okay. Uh, so those are sort of non apologies, defense strategies. Do you have any more of those to discuss? Yeah, there's a couple I have here. One is, uh, of uh it's dawkins oh dawkins yeah okay this is a good one here's the clip and this is uh freddie sears from unheard interviewing uh dawkins who's who's a well-known evolutionary biologist but the vaccines since you mentioned them were they were enormously over promised in terms of what their effect would be uh, they were originally sold to the public as 95 percent effective in the sense of true sense of not getting infected with the virus if you take it that was then endlessly revised downwards and in, in the end it, we were told it didn't stop transmission they only improved outcomes for vulnerable patients which was very different to what was said originally and meanwhile there was this enormously heavy-handed um, policing of whether people should take them including in many places, mandates or near mandates. And that was very uncomfortable to watch. Do you, do you think that's The speed true? with which things were happening means that it's very difficult for people uh, entrusted with authority to give advice. And normally there's much more time in, in order to examine all the evidence and, and give uh, balanced, wise advice. When, you, when you're required to give advice almost instantly is there inevitably are going to be mistakes i'm so surprised that you're not more critical of that era as someone who champions robust debate and um, champions learning from errors admitting when things weren't exactly what you thought they were um, it feels like it was a real classy example of just the politicization we're talking about where Authorities were way over the top. Okay, well, but probably then what, what they should have done, uh, and with hindsight, they should have done, said, well, actually, we don't know. We are, we're uncertain. Um, our best advice we can give is so-and-so. But imagine what would have happened if they'd said that. We don't, scientists don't know. Oh, right, you know, um, they, it, there's, there's, a, there's it's a very difficult situation to be in. I, I, fought, I mean, I'm, luckily for me, I wasn't in that situation. But I sympathize with people who are expected to give... Um, unequivocal yes no sort of advice politicians will say give us the facts is it a yes or a no and you're expected to answer that and and where if the true answer is we don't know then that gives rise to yet more uncertainty and confusion and so i i sympathize with people if they have if they're required to give a yes no answer when they actually don't have the information at hand to it do feels so. like the the damage to scientific authority would have been much less if they had been more modest in their claims and allowed people to make decisions for themselves instead of mandating things that lastly well, proved not yes, to be correct. Well, um, yes, but but um, when when you have to worry about whether um, whether the, whether the right policy is to do what Sweden did or to do what what we did. Um, it, 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 it is a very difficult decision. It's a political decision. It's p politicians need advice from scientists. Scientists have to take it, have to decide how to advise politicians. I think we need to be a bit more sympathetic. And I, I, I haven't noticed a great upwelling of mistrust in scientists as a result of it. I mean, I, for, for me, the, the triumph of the, of the, the speed of the vaccination is, is what I take away from it. <laughs> So there you go. What are your thoughts there, Jeff? Um, there's, you see a lot of justification. It's, I think it's maybe mostly justification to, oh, you know, things had to be done. Things had to be done fast. Um, in hindsight, you know, um, referring to things as mistakes, mistakes were made. So there is some recognition of harm. He's even like, you know, when asked about you know, the, the heavy handedness of things. He's like, well, yes. So he, he acknowledges the harm, but then there's a lot of, a lot of justification for being put in a uncomfortable position of having to make a call 
and how that's perfectly, you know, understandable that somebody would do that. And almost as if like, well, there's, a, there, there would have been more harm in saying, I don't know than in saying something wrong. Yes. And, um, that almost has a hint, a flavor, a touch, a little whiff of victim blaming. Well, it's mm. the problem is that the people are stupid. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. so, if we had done also, this, it would have been, yeah, okay, I like that. Yeah. Right, and it, and it reveals, I think it reveals his elite way of thinking. If the true answer is we don't know, then that gives rise to yet more uncertainty and confusion. Right, mm -hmm. people are generally dumb, and we have to like, <laughs> we're like the smart, we're, we're the smart scientists. We have yeah. all the knowledge. People don't understand the whole nuance of yeah. all the complexities. So we just have to make a judgment call yeah. and impose it on everybody else. And then the, the sheep will do whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the harm is almost couched. I think it's maybe even explicitly, it's oftentimes implicitly couched in terms of like, the real harm is the harm of the, the mistrust in science. That, yeah, so like harming that's right. that, like that's, that's, his, that's the concern. <laughs> that's what he's concerned about. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the yeah, real a few harm. people had lost their jobs, but really are people but still trusting science? If we said, I don't know, then the trust in science would have been devastating. <laughs> right. And, and somehow he believes that science has, has emerged out of the pandemic unscathed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I don't see any uh, issue. By, by he doesn't that, see any like, issues. Quote, unquote, big science, right? Like, yeah. The, yeah. Things are, the things are and he's industry. really impressed with the, he's really impressed with the speed at which the, it was brought, you know, the vaccine was brought to the, to the market. Yeah. There's some, there's some, there's a lot of positives to take away. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, here's the next clip. Let's put a couple of tweets that you did during the uh, pandemic on the screen. Um, you said some faith heads have a ritual of handling snakes, believing faith will protect them. When they're bitten, they deserve it. They alone suffer. Vaccine refusal is different. Others are endangered. It's as though their faith told them to release rattlesnakes in supermarkets. This was April the 6th, 2021. That kind of tone, which was very common among people of influence such as you, which was really vilifying people who were hesitant about taking the vaccine, in retrospect, seems too much, doesn't it? Because maybe it does, they were yes. more right than we realized. Do you, yes. do you take that back? Um, well, I've become aware that the, the, the conventional wisdom about vaccination, which is that it's a matter of um, altruism, uh, because it's, it's, it, it's not simply a matter of saying it, it is my private business whether I'm vaccinated or not. Um, and, in, and in the case of um, the, the measles vaccine, for example, um, it really is a matter of altruism because um, if, you, if you don't get vaccinated, then, then you are part of the problem if, if there's a measles epidemic. I thought that that would be the case with COVID and I, it, it's now not entirely clear that that, that that was right. And so to that extent, I would take that back, yes. Do you now have a view on lockdowns since, we, since we're doing a little uh, tour of the COVID era? No, I don't, I don't have a view. I, I'm not I well- mean, I should say, I'm, as a half Swedish person, we've paid a lot of attention to it. And it, it, we, you talk about double blind trials and yes. scientific process. The fact that Sweden has emerged from the longer period with the lowest excess death count of all of the European countries seems to be a, quite an important scientific point of evidence that possibly lockdowns were not necessary. That, could be, that could be true. And, and um, as uh, John Maynard Keynes is said to have said, um, when, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And, and so, yes, it, 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 there was a need for rapid decisions. The evidence was not yet in and, and mistakes may have been made. You see how hard um, the interviewer has to push to get any kind of remorse or not even remorse, but any kind of acknowledgement of mistake or right. recognition that, you know, the, the, uh, the extent, I think the high point of his, of his sort of capitulation is like getting sort of pressed with like, do you take it back? And he's like, all right, fine. I take it back. I'll take it back. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it back. Which is a new, which is an interesting one. I, that's not on the non-apology or that's not in this, in the strategy sphere that I've seen in the literature of like the, the take back. Yeah. The forced take back. It's like a forced retraction. 
And of course, there's lots of justifications. Yeah, a lot of justification, like with the trying the measles equivalents, and well, you know, it's this is how it was looking like it was going to be, and there's there's lots of reasons why it would have been acceptable under these circumstances. So it was totally justified to to do that yeah. and think and think and think along these lines, draw these equivalences. Yeah. So any last points on these uh, defensive strategies? No, I think I think that's that covers it. I think I think one of the interesting takeaways is how hard it is to dig up any kind of apology. And maybe we could talk a bit about that. Some of the reasons why people, you know, don't apologize or may not, may not be a good idea to apologize, but you know, it has been like a lot happened. Um, and there's a, like, as you, as you outlined off the top, like there's a lot that could be apologized for. Um, but it's really hard to take up examples of apologies. Even even non apologies are a little bit scarce. Not so much, but you, you you don't you don't hear a lot of people talking about it in those ways. So you don't you don't even you don't even necessarily get a lot of non apology strategies in terms of like the denying and the minimizing. You get some, but not not as much as you necessarily think, given where we're at. Yeah, because we were we did a little bit of a search and we thought, oh, we're going to find all these great apologies, and then we can deconstruct them or compare them and so on. We're, we we kept coming up empty. It was very hard to find yeah. anything. So that brings us to the point you raised, which is what are the reasons that people don't apologize? Yeah. And and to be fair, maybe there is apologies. There are apologies happening in people's interpersonal lives or in their workplaces. They're just not on the or, internet. They're not on the internet. Google won't guide you we to We can't them. find them. They're not coming Google across the manipulation check. So if you want to send in your, you know, your recorded apologies, I don't know. No, don't do that. But yeah, so yeah, why don't people apologize? So I think one, there's one interesting study. It's actually pretty, I think it's pretty recent. What's the date on it? I can't remember the date on the study. But it was actually an experimental study where they looked at the effect of, of apologizing. And they actually found that not apologizing results in greater feelings of self-esteem and also feelings of power and some other other positive effects on the uh, assessment of the, your, your view and valuation of yourself. So apologizing actually results in lower self-esteem and lower um, feelings of, of power than not apologizing under a circumstance where there's been some kind of infraction. Yeah, well, see, that's very interesting. And, and I, I certainly would agree probably that's the case. I wouldn't question the findings. But I think there is utility in having a worldview where actually the apologizing is empowering because you become part of the solution to the problem going forward. So like well, maybe this is a mm. cultural issue that we got to deal with. Mm -hmm. We got to bring back in our culture the notion that uh, apologizing is not something that reduces your your level of influence or power um, or your social standing. Mm -hmm. What in fact it does is it, it shows that you can step up, that you're willing to make amends and to, to patch things up and to move forward in a positive way. Like it seems to me like we've got a cultural problem if that finding is true. That's, yeah, so yeah, I was wrong with the data. I thought it was a 2023, but it's actually 2013. So it's it's not super, super recent. Okay. It's not super antiquated either, but, but the... Um, but yeah, the results would definitely be of the contemporary, you know, of the contemporary society. Arguably, maybe that would be worse now. Maybe the findings okay. would be stronger now if there was a social, sociological, socialized component to it. Yeah, maybe certainly. In, in what, if if you're in a society where um, you can never show weakness because otherwise you get, you know, you're the weaker dog and you get chewed up by the stronger dogs, then absolutely mm -hmm. you would not want to apologize, right? You're gonna hold your right. ground. The science yeah, the has shown, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's, the, it's the rational thing to do to not apologize. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And yeah. exactly. Another reason could be, and this, this would speak to not so much maybe interpersonal relations, but would speak to maybe governments, institutions, workplaces being resistant to apologizing because one of the things that apologizing does is it acknowledges your complicity in wrongdoing and in and in harm and that may not be something that people want to necessarily do and for and an for legal reasons for legal reasons yeah 
uh, and we have an example of a clip that from a lawyer that that sort of nicely outlines this. It's kind of a it's kind of a different context, but one that arguably could be could be somewhat uh, related to what we've experienced for the past couple of years. Uh, it's from uh, it has to do with the MK Ultra legal case that was brought um, by some Canadian citizens. Yeah, here's a backgrounder clip. Um, and just remember, everybody, uh, if, if you don't know, MK Ultra was a program that was launched by the CIA. It's very well documented. And there were there were Canadian researchers, particularly at McGill University, but elsewhere as well, who were funded by the CIA or at least uh, uh, encouraged by the CIA to do some experiments on people that I, in hindsight we now would consider unethical. And uh, so here's a little background clip. Hidden among its most sensitive files were CIA records documenting a project called MK Ultra. Between 1957 and 1961, a CIA front funneled about $62,000 US for brainwashing research by Dr. Ewan Cameron. The American media got the story first, but the Fifth Estate exposed the magnitude of the human tragedy. Experimental drugs, including LSD, were administered to human guinea pigs. The patients were never told that their treatment was part of a CIA experiment. And then here's a second clip where basically what happened was uh, a bunch of the people who were subjects in those experiments, which were kind of like clinical treatment experiments, uh, got together and tried to sue the CIA. And uh, here's what the, the, their lawyer is saying. And remember, these are, these are Canadians, okay? Yep. But we expected to have a very potent ally in the form of the Canadian government. And unfortunately, instead of helping their own citizens because the Canadian government was worried about its possible liability, uh, the Mulroney government, in effect, stabbed its citizens in the back at every turn in the litigation. Ottawa actually helped suppress a key piece of information, evidence that CIA officials at the U.S. Embassy had actually apologized to the Canadian government when the CIA experiments were first revealed. Jim Turner is still flabbergasted. You gotta understand how important these apologies and expressions of regret were. This is an admission. This is legally admissible in court because it is one of the parties of the litigation saying, I did something wrong and I'm sorry I did it. That is prima facie evidence of negligence and of wrongdoing that goes a long, long way to bringing the case to a, a timely conclusion instead of the protracted 10 years of litigation that we had. Yeah, and there's a portion of uh, the story that's not covered in those clips, and uh, that's that the government probably suppressed that apology because they were concerned about their own involvement in funding some of those kinds of experiments. So they were just <laughs> trying to um, kind of cover up or hide the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly there you have the case where the CIA, like, think about this. The CIA actually offered an apology. There's a document there, um, mm -hmm. and that had huge legal implications, and that was actually yeah. suppressed by the government. Yeah, you can see, because it establishes right away that if you're apologizing, something had to have happened that just that justifies your apology. So there had to have been some some harm that was done. But one of the things that's interesting in in, in the in the apology. Did you notice who the apology was issued to? The government. The government, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't actually to the individuals. It's like the yeah. CIA said to the government, sorry, we messed around with your citizens. <laughs> yeah, we may have done this, we did this sort of behind your back or whatever on, on your watch and you, didn't, you weren't aware of it, so sorry, but sorry about that. Right, but but the people are, are not allowed to see that apology. They, no. they just have no to- No apology to the people. Uh, yeah. Although there's, there's some examples, I think in the MK Ultra. Uh, history of, uh, I think it was Olson, the um, the agent that ended up dying under mysterious circumstances. I think he was his family was apologized to. I think by the CIA or or Gottlieb. I can't remember exactly, but I think that yeah. the apologies played strongly in terms of uh, managing the family's reactions to their one of their members dying under mysterious circumstances. But that's a whole other story yeah and we should get story. into that some uh, at some point because um you know we're interested in psycho the psychological aspects of everyday situations and certainly the history of the mk ultra program and its effect on behavioral sciences is, is massive mm -hmm. and we should yeah. probably cover that at some point be some very interesting uh stuff to cover yeah, there's a lot there
So I have a few more re- a few more reasons that people don't apologize from this uh, Schumann from these Schumann articles. Um, and if I if I can add to your list, Jeff, is that all right? Yeah, please. So one of them is that uh, people actually don't think that they did something wrong, mm. and um, they tend to sort of not fully appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions. And um, in the article, uh, here's a quote. Past research has demonstrated the existence of a magnitude gap between victims and transgressors' accounts of an offense, with transgressors being more likely to cast the incident as justifiable, out of their control, provoked by the victim, and having fewer lasting consequences. So this idea of of a magnitude gap that... Um, they just perceive the situation as being different. So the victim perceives that they've been wrong, but the offender is like, well, it's not, nothing really I could have done about that wrong. And, and so right. there is this gap. And so you don't, you don't get the, you don't get the uh, apology. So it's not quite denial. Yeah. But it's That's right. Adjacent. It's just not fully appreciating what happened, yeah. which I think actually probably plays a big role in COVID. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Beca- uh, because I, I think that some people who just went along with everything and you know they just never really considered like how it actually might have felt for those who were massive whose life lives were essentially turned upside down mm-hmm. because of this right so right. this just general lack of appreciation and so there probably like having more empathy and putting yourself in other people's shoes might help and go a long way right the related one that Schumann has is that people may actually maybe show little concern or the offended person. They, they really mm. just might not care about that care. person at all. <laughs> yeah. So here's a quote. Recent studies have demonstrated that transgressors who report lower versus higher levels of empathic concern, perspective taking, and care for others' welfare report lower proclivity to apologize. Transgressors who intentionally harm the victim and consequently feel less guilty are less willing to apologize. And transgressors who are more avoidantly attached to the victim i.e are more averse to relationship closeness offer less comprehensive and more defensive apologies in mm-hmm. addition several studies suggest that people who are disproportionately focused on the self rather than others are less willing to apologize that so it's kind of like a good characterization of somebody yeah i'm fine so like what's the big deal yeah um okay i just got a couple more here concern for self-image The recent work suggests that this reluctance might stem from a tendency for transgressors to overestimate the aversiveness of apologizing, anticipating that it would feel more humiliating and stressful to apologize than it actually feels. Because an apology inherently associates a transgressor with wrongful behavior, transgressors might often feel that apologizing is further endangering their sense of being a good person. And again, that that actually might speak to... Our, our culture and the way we view these things because mm-hmm. you could turn that around and you can say, no, no, a good person is one who actually apologizes, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Who recognizes, who is empath- em- empathetic, recognizes when there is a-, a wrong being done by them and then apologizes for it, right? So I- the concern for self-image here, I think is more of a working out of our culture that we might want to mm. think about, rethink, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned the culture again, too, because it makes me remember there was one study I came across where it was on the topic and it was linking in the idea of honor cultures to resistance to apology um, and how it's basically a sign of, you know, weakness or shame, something you shame. Yeah. Yeah, it's honor um, shame. They, that's the that's they, the main dimension. You don't want to yeah, be shamed. They, the the example uh, the examples they used was the U.S. I forget what the other honor culture example they had was, but yeah, it was it was a, it was a study focusing on non apologies or, or hesitancy to apologize based on the cultural the cultural milieu somebody's in, based on the honor culture idea. Yeah, and and the last one I have here, uh, Jeff, is that some people don't apologize because they believe that an apology or apologies in general are not effective. Mm. Um, and yeah, so there, I think what we want to communicate, at least in this podcast, is that for the reasons we mentioned right at the beginning, apologies are actually very effective because they 
provide actually it's like a healing balm on mm -hmm. relationships and on society um, and so we should avail ourselves a lot more of this this uh, this effectively a tool for rebuilding the fabric of society rebuilding relationships um, yeah. And so hopefully if people learned anything from this podcast, it's that apologies are effective and this whole mechanism or process of apologizing and forgiving is going to be one of the main things that that actually, I think, deeply and legitimately heals um, society um, and, and all the damage that was done during the COVID period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the one of the theoretical explanations I particularly like about the sort of the utility of apology is that it it decouples or separates the offender and the offense that so it allows the the victim to sort of see the offender in a different light and to to separate the actions from the person or in, i guess in the broader scheme like the institutions or or what have you that, that allows that reparation that allows that r repair and, and forgiveness to take place yeah. So the the apology acting as that crucial separating mechanism of of the two. Yeah, and 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 the apology obviously would is is got all these benefits, but maybe we should think about. And I don't know the literature on this, but maybe this is for another time. Um, but even if the apology doesn't come, the victim probably is is going to be um, is going is going to get a lot of benefit from nevertheless forgiving, right. Mm. So, so like, is it possible to forgive someone even though they haven't apologized? And if it, if that is, is a, is a possibility, then maybe that's a mechanism f for freeing yourself from the burden of that prior event. You know, even though the other person hasn't apologized yet, maybe at some point they'll mm -hmm. come to realize this and then they'll apologize. And then the whole thing, there's a l next level healing that goes on. Right. But in the meantime, uh, probably not healthy psychologically to be kind of carrying this load, you know, on your shoulders of feeling like you're a victim of prior mm. circumstances, and uh, just forgiving that those individuals and the and the institutions and the situations, um, and that doesn't mean that you automatically sort of like forget and pretend like nothing's happened, um, right? But at least you, you you're, don't you're learn not, lessons. Yeah, you're not weighed down by that right. psychological burden. Yeah. Yeah, you could still remember and retain the lessons learned and have the awareness without the, yeah, without that, yeah, like you said, that burden being weighed down by that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. That might be a tall order <laughs> for some. Yeah, that's, these are hard things, right? Yeah. These are, these are hard things. They require, I think, an, uh, an, an a fortitude. Um, and, mm. but it would be, you know, it'd be amazing if we could build that into our culture so that we could actually, because there's always going to be somebody offending someone else. That's that's going to happen no matter how hard we try to some degree. And this is the mechanism by which we get past those and move to to you know newer and better ground. Mm. That's nicely said. How about we leave it there then? That's a great ending, yep. All right. We'll talk to you later, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Dan.